we're hungry or when we're thirsty, there's, there's an innate desire, right? We want to live. That's our, that's our desire. An animal, it wants to live, right? It knows to eat and to drink. And the thing that becomes important is without water, you could survive approximately one week. Without food, a little longer, approximately three weeks. But the point being here is that without hunger and without thirst and without the, the focus that we need to feed our bodies and, uh, and keep, to keep them going, we would die. And so fundamentally, we must hunger and thirst to live, right? That's, is that an understanding? Is that a given in this realm? Now, a quote here, and somehow I didn't get Arnold Schwartz. There we go. Sorry. For me, life is continuously being hungry. The meaning of life is not simply to exist, to survive, but to move ahead, to go up, to achieve, to conquer. And this is Arnold Schwarzenegger. And so the worldly view, using Arnold here, is what? That we need to be hungry because it's a motivation, right? It gives us something to, to strive for. If we're not hungry in life, what do we do? Nothing, potentially. Yeah. So looking at the basics of hunger and thirst, let's look at the spiritual ramifications of that. Uh, start out reading Matthew 4, verse 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So it's not just physical needs, it's spiritual needs. Our hunger and thirst can't just be satisfied by what we eat and what we drink. There's more to it than that. God envisioned more to it than that. Ew, I didn't do this right. Uh, continuing on with that, you know, when we look at this verse specifically, uh, to thirst and to hunger from a godly perspective is characterized by morality, right? How we, how we perceive things in the world, what we believe is wrong and right, and uh, acting in an upright, moral, virtuous way really kind of defines what, what character God expects from us and what it means to kind of hunger and thirst for righteousness in that righteousness realm. When we think of righteousness, sometimes we have a, a, a bad connotation of it, right? Oh, he thinks he's righteous. What do we mean by that? <laughs> Holier than thou? Yeah, might, might think that, that you got it figured out. You're, you're kind of better than, uh, than everyone else. And that's kind of where this cartoon comes in. And Frank, I know you can't read it, so I'll, I'll read it to you. The, uh, the gentleman here is talking to the, uh, the lady and uh, telling her, uh, have you seen my breastplate of righteousness anywhere? Kind of a, a mindset of, hey, you know, look at me, I'm important. My slides are all messed up tonight, so I apologize in advance for that. Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So, here we see a Woodstock has a big appetite. Does that describe us? Do we have a big appetite? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, blessed are those whose goal, is it, is it as simple as this? Blessed are those whose goal is righteousness? Is that what's being referred to in this verse? Is that enough? Is it my goal to be hunger, hungering and thirsting, if that's a word, hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Is that enough? Yeah, Frank?
No, and and back to it, you know, when we when we look at the verse in verse six, uh, Matthew chapter five, right? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And so, when I ask this question of blessed are those whose goal is righteousness, is having the goal gonna get us where we need to be? What about blessed are those who have a desire for righteousness? And I said to righteousness. Once again, this wasn't checked by anyone but me, so you can blame me. But is it a desire for righteousness? Is that enough? Tim. Great point. Yes. <laughs> That's funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and you're exactly right in terms of, you know, if it's it's not enough for us just to say we're seeking it or or that you know we have it in some minor fashion, but when we talk about hunger, it's carrying that big sandwich, right? That we want more, we're we're wanting it more than anything else, right? We're hungering for the knowledge, for the growth, for the ability. Yes. Yes, it is. It is definitely a need. Yes, in the back, and then I'll get to you, Naomi. Sorry, that's you. I said back. You're in the back to me. I apologize. (laughs) Yeah. Great point. Yeah, it, it definitely is something that focuses us intently on that and our thought process is completely there if we're truly hungry. Naomi. Mm-hmm. You're talking in the Greek? Uh, I'm going to defer to, to Sam because I didn't actually look up the Greek on this. <laughs> you got an answer for that, Sam? I don't. I can uh, definitely look into that, but great, great, great question. KD. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would think it tends towards that. I mean, in everything that I've, I've been studying, that's kind of where, where this class is headed and it, what it's tending to. But I didn't actually look that up, so I'm not going to go on the record and commit. <laughs> so where were you when I asked you the question? <laughs> All right, Katie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Great points. I appreciate all the comments. And so uh, in the time of Jesus, to hunger meant something different than it does to us today. This has kind of already been alluded to, but uh, given that food was scarce, right? You didn't just go down to King Supers, as Sam likes to always say, because he loves King Supers, right, Sam? You couldn't go to King Supers and just buy whatever you needed right then, right? You actually had to work for it, right? Maybe go pick it, hunt for it, do something. And it wasn't always available. So 
when we talk about being hungry in the time of Jesus, it had a little more weight. And then when we talk about thirst, was there plentiful water? I don't know, Sam, you just visit. I keep pointing to you because you've done all this and said it all. But my understanding is that water wasn't readily available everywhere. I think it wasn't as dry as it is now, but it was still fairly arid. Yeah. And so, so when we look at it from that standpoint, and we're hungering or we're thirsting, and we can't get what we want, as was alluded to earlier, we really start to focus on it. It becomes way more important to us. And today, especially in this country, I think we miss that urgency. There's really no hunger that we know of, right? When we say we're hungry, what does that mean? We haven't eaten for a couple hours potentially, right? Or we're thirsty. Yeah, I haven't had a, had a drink in a couple hours, but it's not days, right? Yes, read. Yeah, great point. Great point. Definitely, uh, definitely was used by uh, by the devil and the temp, you know, the temptation of Jesus. Yes. Yeah. And talking in a spiritual sense, yes. I mean, if you if you lose that hunger, that motivation, right? Eventually, you probably do become numb to it. Was there someone? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So you didn't, you didn't actually, <laughs> you asked what happens on day seven? Oh, day seven. <laughs> Probably, right? So do we hunger and thirst to seek righteousness? Think about it from an athlete standpoint. If, if they don't give all their effort, what happens? They lose. They don't grow. They don't get any better, right? I mean, that's that's a great example, right? Because, like like me, right? I wanna I wanna start running, and uh, I'm gonna run several miles, right? But do I start at several miles? <laughs> I started, yeah. Hopefully, a couple blocks, right? Hopefully, I can do that. But but you don't just get there. You don't just get to the end result. It takes a lot of a lot of effort, a lot of work, a lot of motivation, right? A lot of hunger to get there. If you're playing a sport professionally, do you think those athletes had a lot of hunger to achieve to that level? Yeah, and so if they don't and they just kind of coast through, we might say they rest on their laurels, right? Which means what? Just enough to get by, right? As, as I tell my daughter all the time, the bare minimum. But is that, what we're, is that what we're living for? Is that what we want? Is that what God wants is the better question, right? And finally, the point is that they lack hunger. And so back to that point of doing the bare minimum. If we get C's in school, do we pass? Yeah? Is the C good enough? <laughs> Was a C good enough for your children? <laughs> Why not? 
Why is it not good enough? Yeah, maybe you're not understanding or maybe you're just not really wanting to put in the effort to do better. Sorry? Content with mediocrity. Exactly. And so John 2, uh, verse 17. 2, verse 17. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Do we have zeal? Do we have a zeal for Christ? Do we have that hunger that we're going to serve him and that we're going to try to do better and we're going to continue to grow? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so that being said, to become righteous, what does it take? It takes effort, right? You can't just uh, take it in a, by osmosis, right? Even though when I was in school, that's what I really wanted to do. I wanted to sleep on my book and, and be able to, to know what I was studying, but that's not how it works. It takes effort from us. It takes a hunger to know God's word. It takes a desire to do so. Yes. Great. Yeah. Great points. And once again, I apologize for the, for the cartoons. I know they're small. I try to blow them up as big as possible. But uh, for those of you that sit in front, maybe that's an encouragement. If you want to read them, you have to sit in front. So, uh, so maybe next week, I'm going to just stop reading them and you guys can, can move forward. But... Uh, we want the approval of God, but in the, same, in the same breath, we also want the applause of men. What do you think I mean by that? Yeah. We like to be noticed by other people, right? We like to be appreciated by other people that we associate with. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and does approval from God come immediately? He does. Yeah, exactly. Like back when I was in school, if you did good in elementary school, you got a scratch and sniff sticker, right? Do you get that today? Do they even have those today? <laughs> Probably not, yeah. You are correct. Yeah, it does. I mean, th we learn more from our failures than our successes, right? That's, that's something that I firmly believe in. That's something that we see throughout the Bible. And unfortunately, we've decided as a society here in the United States to take that out of the equation and not allow people to fail or to have a mistake. Sam. Mm -hmm. 
Great point. Yeah, great point. Great point. Who are we? Who are we pleasing? Men or God? And so uh, Calvin here, you guys are, are familiar with him and those in the back. I'm going to have to read it to you. But uh, he's coming to his dad. Bad news, dad. Your polls are way down. And his dad's asking, my polls? Huh? Your rate especially is especially low among three, oh, sorry, um, among tigers and six-year-olds and six-year-old white males. I need to be able to read, sorry. If, if you want to stay dad, I'd suggest you adopt some key planks to your platform. Some special interest groups are in for a surprise, dad's saying. But uh, Calvin continues, of those polled, virtually all favor increased allowances and all, oh, sorry, and the, I can't even read it because it's too small, and the commencement of driving lessons. So, so here's, here's an example of what I'm talking about, right? Is, yeah, we want to serve God, but we want approval of men. And here, he, he's playing on that, right? He's trying to get his dad to, hey, well, you want, you want the six-year-olds to, and the tigers to appreciate you, this is what you got to do. And that's kind of the way our society operates, right? We can't make a decision unless we do that litmus test, right? We've got to kind of feel it out before we do it. But what are we after? The approval of God or the applause of men? So spiritual thirst. Let's look at some verses to, uh, to evaluate this a little further. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. And uh, sorry, Sam, I know you're still headed down this road. So uh, verse 13, the conclusion, when all has been heard is, Fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. Fear God and keep his commandments. Do we have that thirst? Does it matter to us? And when I say fear, what do I mean? A healthy respect, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and that's part of our, our thirsting is, do we, do we really want to keep his commandments? Is that important to us? Or is it something that we just hear about on Sundays or maybe a Wednesday night when we show up, but the rest of the time we don't really care? Is it important to us? I mean, when we look through, the, through Ecclesiastes, right, this is kind of the conclusion here. It says that straight up, right? This is pretty important. Do we care? Yes. Great, great, great example, right? It's who we are all the time when, when someone's not looking, right? Acts 17, 26 through 28. Acts chapter 17, 26 through 28. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Verse 27 that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him. Though he also, oh, sorry. I, I always lose lines here, so I apologize. Though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. 
Do we thirst for a relationship with God? Is that important to us? Is our relationship with God something that motivates us, that we thirst for, that without it, we're going to die? Is that how important it is to us? It should be. And then Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Spiritual thirst. Are we seeking him? What are we after? Romans 1, 18 through 32. Does someone want to read this so you don't have to listen to me up here mess around and, and mess up lines? Romans 1, 18 through 32. That's a pretty big reading, so I can understand if no one wants to. Okay, Mark. Yeah, so, so the consequences of unbelief are listed here. And thank you, Mark, for, for reading all that. But fundamentally, what does it get down to? It's my point up there, right? Life without God is disappointing, right? That's why we need to have this thirst. And uh, the cartoon up there, and I'll just paraphrase, they're out in the middle of the desert, and they find a water fountain, and the first guy is there, running the water, waiting for it to get cold. You think the people behind him appreciate that? <laughs> but does that define us as well? You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get around to it when it's, when it's time, when it makes sense. Or do we thirst? Do we have that innate desire? 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 5. Does someone want to read that for me? We'll look at that one, and then Colossians 3, 1 and 2. So 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 5. Who would like to read that? Sam? Thank you. So, as was mentioned earlier, we, we long to be with God, right? We have that hole in our, in our existence that's only filled by God. Men desires that. And, and in this situation, right, that's the thirst that we're after, right? We're trying to satisfy that, that want, that need, that desire. Uh, Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. Frank? Yeah. 
What are we focused on? Are we focused on those important things? Are we focused on things above? Are we focused on... I have to go to the grocery store. And I say that because I don't like to go to the grocery store. Luckily, my wife is not here. But what are we focused on? Or how bad the situation is, or, oh, I have to go to work tomorrow, or what are we focused on? Who's going to win the Super Bowl? Where should our focus be? Does it really matter, any of that other stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, but are we thirsting for that stuff, right? I mean, that's maybe the better, the better way to state it is, is our life contingent upon those activities that we maybe do daily? Yeah, we need to do some of it part of life but what are we really striving to be who are we striving to be is the better statement there yes Exactly. Exactly. You, you are exactly right. And it's, it's all a matter of perspective, right? Where I could look at the grocery store as, I hate dealing with the grocery store. I just don't like dealing with people. Or in that process, I can be looking at it as Ivan alluded to, an opportunity for me to gain nourishing food for my family. I'm glad my wife is not here, so please don't tell her this. Um, <laughs> But also an opportunity for us to show a good example to others, right? When that person jams in front of you to look at something or in line. Matthew 6, verse 33. And does someone have that? Matthew 6, verse 33. Yes, Ron. Thank you. If we hunger and thirst, we will be blessed. Hunger and thirst for God, right? That's the key in this, uh, this process. And so how do we satisfy, how do you satisfy your physical appetite? Well, obviously you feed it, right? You give it food. Does it matter what kind of food? I love potato chips. Am I good just eating potato chips? You'll probably say I've eaten too many. But, but the problem is there's good and there's bad food, right? There's food that nourishes us. And then there's food that just kind of, I guess, fills the void. Right? Or what about this? Can we overeat? Or can we eat the correct amount? Right? There's ways that we feed our body uh, appropriately. So what if we stop eating? Well, obviously what? Things go haywire if we stop eating, and that's the problem. So we choose when and how to satisfy that hunger. What about spiritually? Is it the same? I don't see any, any, anybody willing to, uh, to comment. Are you shaking your heads yes or no? So... We can satisfy ourselves and the hunger we have from teachings of the world, right? Is there a lot of that out there? A lot of misinformation, Frank? Yeah. 
No, and, and you're exactly right. We can, we can feed on the potato chips, right, in, uh, in Galatians 1, and just quickly here, uh, verse, starting in verse 6, I'm amazed that you, you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, right? That, that kind of describes what you're talking about, how quickly we forget, how it's simpler to just eat potato chips, right? I don't want to have to go get the good stuff because it costs more, takes more time to prepare. Potato chips good? Does that describe our spiritual thirst or hunger? Second John verse 9. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teachings of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teachings, he has both the Father and the Son. Once again, do we succumb to worldly views or do we rise above that? Sam. Great, great points. And uh, that was the second bell. The, uh, the cartoon up here, I know the text is really small. The student's talking to his teacher, and he has seven times five equals 75. And his comment to her is, it may be wrong, but it's how I feel. Does that describe our Christian walk? Hopefully not, right? That's why it's important that we, that we hunger and we thirst for that righteousness. And we'll continue on next week. Uh, appreciate everybody's participation. Any final comments? All right. Thank you.